the mystery and power of the oceans have always attracted human curiosity. Perhaps it's an instinctive response, a recognition that the sea is the primeval origin of life. For thousands of years, people have been venturing into the oceans in pursuit of empire, fortune, or simply to find out what's there. Our knowledge of the sea, its currents and moods, has been built up and passed from one generation of mariners to the next, through a lot of trial and a lot of error. But now, a new generation of explorers is taking much of the guesswork and hazard out of our understanding of the oceans. I guess it, uh, scientists are attracted to the sea because it's, it's physically and it's intellectually tough uh, to get your information to try and work out what's going on. For oceanographers, the process of scientific discovery has traditionally depended on patient observation, often over long periods of time and vast distances. But now, new technology has come to the rescue, and the immense scale of the oceans has been reduced to a more manageable form. I think uh, you've got to understand that um, oceanographers have been limited by their instrumentation, and it's only in the past 10 or 15 years that we've got, for example, satellite imagery, satellite track buoys, uh, the capability of measuring currents from our research vessel, and these things mean that we can tackle problems and we can find things that weren't known to exist before. For more than two decades, Dr George Cresswell and his fellow marine scientists in the CSIRO have been probing the mysteries of the oceans that surround Australia. Right, oh, well, there we are. We think that that'll hold it for a year or two, Carl. In the early 1970s, they designed and built the first ocean buoys, whose movements could be tracked by satellite. Yeah, well, that's what we're hoping for. We want the buoy system to last for a couple of years, and chafing's one of our main problems. On a series of cruises off the coast of Western Australia, they launched the buoys into what was originally believed to be a north-flowing ocean current. When they analysed the complicated series of tracks detected by satellite, they found instead a pattern of southward movement down the coast and around Cape Lewin. The Cape was named after a Dutch vessel, which first sighted the west coast of Australia over 360 years ago. The Lewin, or Lioness, was the first vessel to venture around the Cape and into the Great Australian Bight. Cresswell and his colleagues thought it appropriate that the current revealed by the drifting buoys be called the Lewin Current. The Lewin Current uh, essentially flows the wrong way for a current on the eastern side of an ocean. It flows into pretty strong prevailing winds. Uh, it brings warm water from the tropics down to Cape Lewin and then across the Great Australian Bight. For us physical oceanographers, it's exciting because it's strong. Uh, it's locked to the uh, continental shelf edge, more or less as if it's running on a rail. It has breakouts to sea where it forms eddies and offshoots. All of these things excite us because they're complex and difficult to study, but they're very important uh, in the national interest, fisheries, defence, things like that. But these researchers weren't the first to suspect the existence of a mysterious warm current in these parts. In the 1890s, the Abrolhos Islands off the coast of Geraldton had been visited by the British naturalist William Savile Kent. Savile Kent recorded his impressions in a lavishly illustrated book. He was fascinated by the unique flora and fauna he found on the Abrolhos. He wrote of the very remarkable interblending of both tropical and temperate marine organisms there, and concluded 
that but one interpretation seems possible, an ocean current setting in from the equatorial area of the Indian Ocean penetrates as far south as this island group. Savile Kent's theory was not to be proved correct for another 80 years, because it's only in recent times that techniques have become available to accurately follow the current's narrow, seasonal and erratic path. On a global scale, the ocean currents form giant eddies, which run clockwise in the northern hemisphere and anti-clockwise in the south. This carries cold water along the west coasts of all the continents. For example, the cold north-flowing Humboldt current off the west coast of South America. And the cold Benguela current off the west coast of Southern Africa. But off the west coast of Australia, things are different. The Lewin runs against the prevailing flow, actually accelerating into the driving winds at speeds up to a metre a second. In the process, it has a significant effect on weather and marine life. And this is why it's so fascinating to scientists. Satellite imagery is an extremely valuable tool in studying ocean currents like the Lewin Current, which are so much warmer than the water around them. And here in Western Australia, we're extremely lucky in having an archive of some five years of satellite images of the waters off Western Australia. And we're using these in the study of the climatology of the Lewin Current, in which we're looking for the waxing and waning of the Lewin Current seasonally, and possibly affects like El Nino, which happens every few years. This image that we have here is taken in June 1984 and shows the Lewin Current in full flight. On the right we have the land with Shark Bay up in the north, Cape Lewin down here and Perth about here. This is cloud offshore and the Lewin Current is the band of warm water shown in red which streams down the coast. We're interested in this what appears to be an onshore flow in this region there's clearly a jet down the shelf break south of Geraldton, and then it meanders offshore, swings back in towards the coast off Perth, and then continues southwards past Cape Lewin. And one of the unique features about the Lewin Current is that it then seems to turn left at Cape Lewin and heads off towards the Great Australian Bight, and we know that in some years it gets as far as Tasmania too. If it weren't for the Lewin Current, the lush southwest of Australia would be denied much of its winter rain. It could perhaps even be a desert, like the corresponding areas of South America and South Africa. But in the warm waters of the Lewin, there are no vast populations of fish such as anchovies and sardines, nurtured by cold, nutrient-rich currents. Instead, there are scenes more reminiscent of the tropics. The Abrolhos Islands support among the most southerly coral formations in the world. They are as splendid and rich in life as any on the Great Barrier Reef. Yet despite this apparent abundance, these waters yield little of value to commercial fishermen, with the spectacular exception of one remarkable species. The Western Rock Lobster has become by far Australia's richest export fishery, worth around $150 million a year. The tails will find their way to the tables of New York. And there is a growing market for live lobsters which are destined for the restaurants of Japan. The western rock lobster, Panulirus cygnus, is uniquely adapted to the vagaries of the Lewin current. Researchers from the Western Australian Fisheries Department and CSIRO Marine Laboratories are collaborating on major research programs to study its life cycle, ecology and behaviour. We're tagging rock lobsters in an attempt to follow individual breeding females through their life cycle. Uh, basically in an attempt to find out how many times they spawn in a year. Previously it was thought it was one, once a year, but uh, my research so far has shown that the majority of the population spawn twice a year. 
13.8 male. We tag most of the animals that come out of the pots and uh, we gain additional information on the biology such as growth information and, and information on uh, movements when rock lobster fishermen pick them up later on in the season. 107.0. During the mating process, the male deposits a spermatophore, or what's commonly called the tar spot, on the sternum of the female. When the female is then ready to lay eggs, she assumes a position on the uh, seabed floor where she tucks her tail underneath her, and the pleopods, that you can see here, rhythmically beat to create a current which draws water back into this brood pouch which has been formed. The eggs are then extruded through these ovi pores on the third pair of the walking legs there. The spermatophore or tar spot has been uh, scratched by the walking legs. So the eggs and the spermatozoa are drawn back into the brood pouch and fertilization occurs. The fecundity or number of eggs in a brood ranges obviously with size, uh, but ranges somewhere between about 100,000 and 900,000 eggs with an average around about 200 to 500,000. The newly hatched larvae, or phylosomy, are almost transparent, barely visible to the eye. They go through repeated moltings, finally reaching about 35 millimetres in length after about a year. And it's during this stage that they undertake an extraordinary journey, thanks again to the Lewin current. On its long journey south, the warm waters of the Lewin sometimes develop breakouts to sea, which eventually swing back again to the shore. It's now thought that meanders of the current like this are a major mechanism by which the lobster larvae are carried out to sea and eventually returned to the safety of the coastal reefs. Here they settle in their final planktonic stage, known as the purulus, ready to molt into juvenile miniatures of the adult lobster. And it's here, in the limestone reefs and lagoons at Seven Mile Beach near Geraldton, that CSIRO has been carrying out what must surely be the longest running study of any sea animals in Australia. Okay, Dave, male, two legs, red. Two legs? Yeah, two legs missing, that is 64.8. Okay. No LS, no RS. Well, they're in fact several programs here, but the, the longest running one that we have is one that started in 1967, looking at the settlement of young rock lobsters in this area. These collectors, made of artificial seaweed, have proved to be an ideal refuge for the infant lobsters. By regularly checking the collectors, scientists are able to get a reliable index of the numbers of purulus that have settled on the reefs. This, in turn, indicates the numbers of lobsters which can safely be harvested in four years' time, when they have reached the legal catching size. Other research programs involve analysing the feeding behaviour of the juvenile lobsters. Core samples are taken from the seabed. And an ingenious vacuum airlift collects materials from the weed beds. Cages are used to keep the lobsters either in or out of an area to see what difference they make to the density of food. The idea of the program is to determine the conditions and nutrients which give the optimum growth rates to the young lobsters.
But perhaps the most intriguing line of research is a program to determine the foraging habits of lobsters. How far will a lobster go to get a feed? Does it have territorial limits? There seemed only one way to find out. That was to place small electromagnetic tags onto the lobster's backs. With a receiving wire grid laid out across the seafloor, the lobster's nocturnal haunts are revealed. The study has found they stay out all night, often follow set foraging paths, and can travel up to 800 metres in a single night. But the waters of the Lewin hold even greater secrets than these. A chain of reefs stretches for over 2,000 kilometres off the western border of the continent from the fringing Ningaloo track in the north to the temperate water of the southwest. And here, on one night of the year, can be seen one of nature's most spectacular displays, the breeding of coral. Normally, there is no coral off the western coasts of continents because the water is too cold. But the warm Lewin starts to flow in autumn and that's when the corals begin to breed. The amazing thing about the coral spawning is that uh, it occurs at a very predictable time each year and we've been able to predict the exact time within about five minutes in the past few years on tropical reefs in Western Australia. But certainly the amazing thing is that, and it's unique in the biological world, that many different species of corals are all spawning at the same time. And it's not just the coral larvae that hitch a ride with the Lewin. These tiny creatures have been plucked from the ocean hundreds of kilometres off the northwest coast. They might look like small fry. In fact, they are the larvae of one of our most important commercial fish, the southern bluefin tuna. Very little is known about the early life history of the tuna, although by studying the biology of the larvae and doing some clever scientific detective work, a surprising amount can be deduced. This is the ear bone of the larval tuna, the only bone which is calcified at this stage. The dark and light lines are due to a daily cycle of calcium metabolism. So each pair represents one day. Thus, it's possible to age the larva and calculate the spawning date of its adult parent. Catching the tuna larvae is a case of literally finding a speck in the ocean. Japanese researchers have been looking for the larvae all over the world and have found them in the same area that is thought to provide the source water for the Lewin current. The southern bluefin tuna spawn in a fairly large area south of Indonesia. Um, as, as juvenile fish, whilst they're, they're probably active swimming at that stage, um, they've probably um, helped in their southerly migration by the Lewin Current and helped contained close to the Australian coast by the Lewin Current. When they reach the corner of Western Australia, a large number of the developing tuna follow the current into the Great Australian Bight. Here they become the target of the Australian tuna fishery. These fish are destined to wind up on the supermarket shelf as food for both people and cats. But for the Japanese, tuna are a different kettle of fish altogether. Japanese boats pursue the bigger tuna, using lines up to 80 kilometres in length in the deep southern waters between Africa and New Zealand. And in the sashimi restaurants of Tokyo, they're a prized delicacy indeed. Sashimi preparation is an art form. The end product, eaten raw, bears little resemblance in appearance or taste to the stuff of an Aussie tuna sandwich. The difference is reflected in the relative value of the fish. The average tuna caught by the Australian fishery is worth about $10 but a good quality, carefully handled fish caught for the Japanese market 
can be worth $1,000 or more. It's not surprising that the Australian industry is starting to look to the sashimi market. The implications of the Lewin are obviously far-reaching and are covered by several scientific disciplines. So throughout this year, CSIRO has been conducting a major research program called Project Lucy. Lucy, it stands for the Lewin Current Interdisciplinary Experiment and it's the major piece of work that the Division of Oceanography of CSIRO is going to do this year. Most of our scientists are tied up in Lucy and uh, we're using uh, Franklin to collect most of the information on the currents. We want to know its temperatures, its salinities, the nutrients in it and the way the currents vary through it. Well, to give you some idea of the scale of uh, this operation, we've got about 70 people in the Division of Oceanography. Probably three quarters of them are tied up with either being on the ship at different times or running the experiment from back in Hobart. Well, Franklin's two years old. It's a modern, very well-equipped ship. It's as good as any in the world. It's got a variety of excellent equipment on board. Uh, for example, it can measure currents as the ship's going along. It sends down some sonar beams and it can profile temperature and salinity and other properties to the bottom of the ocean. The CTD, it stands for Conductivity, Temperature and Depth Profiler. It measures conductivity and from that we can calculate salinity and temperature which I've just measured. It also measures oxygen and that's what we oceanographers need to get an understanding of the ocean's properties and work out where it's going and where the water's coming from. Where the Lewin waters come from is still something of a mystery. But it is known that high sea level and persistent trade winds force a volume of warm water from the Pacific through the Indonesian islands into the Indian Ocean, raising the sea level. And from there, the water literally runs downhill along the Western Australian coast. Drifting buoys are used to follow the current's movements. Their position is relayed via satellite to Hobart, where computers translate the signals into images. Occasionally, there is an oceanographic front, a confluence of cold water with warm arms of the Lewin. And when this occurs, there is a bloom of tiny marine organisms, which once again bring the fish and the birds. Even the dolphins turn up to join in the feast. At times like this, an ingenious and sophisticated instrument called the bunyip comes into its own. The rocket-shaped buoy is towed behind the Franklin, sometimes throughout the night. The bunyip is steered by the small winged vehicle which can fly it wherever the shipboard scientists want it to go. We've um, developed Bunyip here to uh, take a lot of vertical profiles in the ocean. We do this by towing uh, the two vehicles, and the first vehicle has uh, wings that rotate, and uh, we can control the wings from, from here, from this computer. And here we have the wing angle, 13 degrees, displayed in this uh, little uh, diagram and the pitch of the vehicle, uh, 10 degrees, which says that the, the vehicle is trying to go up this, um, this sawtooth uh, shape here, decreasing its depth. And then um, in the top of the screen here we have the, the depth of the uh, first vehicle and um, the tension on the cables is 10% uh, and 7% of braking strain of the cable. The, um, the first vehicle is just there to, to provide uh, the depth variability, the wings. And uh, the second vehicle is an aerodynamically smooth torpedo shaped vehicle and uh, it measures uh, the uh, mean properties to a resolution of a metre or so and also measures the turbulence properties down to a scale of a centimetre. And from these very small scale uh, features we can deduce the amount of mixing in the ocean. 
And we've been collecting current data uh, from the surface down under 400 metres. We've been getting that every few minutes. Uh, we've been getting surface salinity and temperature. We've been dropping expendable temperature probes that drop down 700 metres and give us the temperature structure. Uh, we've also been getting the fluorescence or the amount of phytoplankton in the water. Okay, it's, it's five o'clock in the morning. We've had a pretty interesting night. We've been way out to sea and then we've come back in again. Now we've come across a cyclonic or a cold eddy. This eddy's being spun up by the Lewin current. Right now we're sitting in a three knot current and you can probably feel the ship shaking around a little bit. We think that that three knot current, when it spins up the eddy, it's contributing to the enrichment of the water that you saw earlier today with those porpoises and the birds, etc. We've collected a lot tonight and we're going for three weeks on this cruise. The data collected on this and similar cruises will provide a vast amount of information, most of which will be processed at CSIRO's marine laboratories in Hobart. It's a measure of its importance to both our weather and marine life that such technological and human resources have been dedicated to understanding the Lewin.